Good morning, everybody from Silicon Valley, California. I'm Donal O'Shea of the FIDO Alliance, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar on FIDO's UAF standard. Our presenter today is Ralph Lindemann from Not Up Labs. Ralph is speaking to us from Hamburg uh, uh, right now. Uh, we'll take questions via the GoToWebinar Q&A feature. I don't guarantee we'll answer them all, but we'll try. Um, okay, Ralph, go ahead, please. Hello and good evening or good morning, wherever you are. So in this FIDO UF tutorial, we'll see how FIDO UF addresses today's authentication challenges. And we've seen quite a few of those challenges. For example, we have seen a lot of attacks which were focused Ralph, on the there? servers. Yes, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Donald, can you hear me? Ralph. Yes, we can hear you, Ralph. Okay, that's fine. So we have seen a lot of Russian criminals, for example, which have stolen in total 1.2 billion internet usernames and passwords from different servers. And we have seen other attacks which were not focused on the server side, but focused on the client side. For example, Chase Bank customers have been targeted by massive phishing attacks. So essentially, people have sent out emails to millions of customers which have then entered their passwords into those websites. And in the end, um, the attackers were able to impersonate as those users. The third type of attack we have seen was more complicated, and it's like a very concerted attack um, called Eurograbber, where the attack cares were able to steal 36 million euros. They attacked the PCs to install a Trojan horse, and they attacked the mobile phones to actually uh, divert the text messages with a one-time password to the attacker. So, uh -huh. How does authentication work today? Um, at this time, people are not born with Wi-Fi interfaces in their head, so they need something, a proxy device, in order to authenticate to a cloud server. And this is what we do every day when we enter our password. We have a local computer, it might be our laptop, it might be our um, smartphone, which we use to enter a username, enter a password, click enter, and the application running on that phone is then transferring that data to the server. So we usually don't really think about the security of that endpoint device, and especially the server doesn't have, um, does have very little knowledge about the security of that endpoint device and the other characteristics. So primarily today we are using passwords, and we have seen a lot of issues with passwords already. So one issue was addressed in the first slide, passwords could be stolen from the server. So that is a, rel is a relatively new attack in this, um, let's say, ma massive dimension we have seen that um, these days, that people were able to invest some money in some attack software and then steal thousands, 100,000, or even millions, hundreds of millions passwords out of that server. So independent on how secure you is, choose your password and how secure you keep your password, the password can be stolen from the server, which is not good because it's not under control of the owner of that password. And this really is tied to the characteristic of that password. Essentially, the password is a symmetric token. So the, the server has to know the password, and you have to know your password. And the attacker could attack either side to get the password from. But additionally, passwords could be entered into untrusted apps or websites, and it's very difficult for end users to understand how secure an app is and whether this is a legitimate app which is intended to receive your password or not. There's no way, because the optical appearance can easily be forged by attackers. And of course, we have too many passwords to remember. So I've counted my accounts and I ended up with well above 500 different username and password combinations. And in order to make this secure, currently the best gu guideline or best practice is to choose different passwords for different websites and not have a, a very generic rule. Uh, so to avoid the password 1234 uh, kind of, of simple password pattern. And of course, especially with today's move to all these smaller devices, the smartphones, uh, we see that it's very inconvenient to type a password on a phone. 
so we don't really want to use a password. And um, there are interesting studies showing that, for example, um, password is, is um, not used very often to uh, secure the, the, the lock screen for smartphones. In most uh, cases, the smartphone is un unprotected completely. Now, this was a reason for Apple to come up with a touch ID and have a fingerprint sensor to unlock the phone. And this was also uh, be used by uh, companies like Samsung to add fingerprint sensors to make it more convenient. Now, the second way to authenticate to servers is what we currently use for, let's say, the more sensitive sites like banking sites. It's uh, called a one-time password. So in addition to our static normal password, we, we either receive a one-time passcode over a text message uh, to, your, to our phone, or we have a one-time password generator, a small hardware token. But we have issues with those OTPs as well. So first, they are vulnerable to the real-time and the middle attacks and then in the browser attacks. So even though we might have you might use this kind of OTP hardware token, uh, still an attacker in the middle could receive that one-time passcode, could modify the transaction, and could send this modified transaction along with the intercepted one-time passcode to the server and then execute a modified transaction on the server, which on, on the user's behalf. Now, especially when we use the smartphone or the device where we receive the text message with a one-time passcode as a primary transaction device, the security is questionable. So this is mostly um, forbidden by the general terms and conditions um, by those institutions at this time. But in the end, we would like to have a way to use our smartphone for online banking, for example, without degraded security. And third, if we are not using text messages to receive a one-time password, but using hardware tokens, those tokens are expensive and people don't want, uh, don't want another device. So it's, it's simpler to have just the smartphone and not the, the need to carry another device to tap that on the smartphone or do something else. And of course, especially for mobile devices, it's still inconvenient to type one-time passwords on our phones. It's much more convenient to, differ to do different things. And now, if you look to the different applications we're using on the internet, we see that we have different security needs. It's not only a single, let's say, risk level we have. So for example, if you want to log in to a website, this has a completely different risk characteristic than um, a task, for example, to delete all emails we might want to do in our email portal, or to change the shipping address, right? ordering something to a established shipping address is not that risky because worst case is you ship it back to, to companies like Amazon and you get your money back. But if this, uh, goods are shipped to a different address, the attacker could get the goods. So it's a different risk profile. Or sharing dental records or health records in general. Or transferring money, especially if it goes to, to higher amounts of money, like $10,000. Then we have different authentication needs. And maybe we want to use a different authentication method than just username and password. But today, our only answer is ask the user for a username and a password. So in summary, passwords are insecure. They are inconvenient, especially on mobile devices. Alternative authentication methods are silos. So we have seen the one-time passwords, which somehow require you to use a one-time password generator or have an OTP um, uh, sending server um, over, uh, which is connected to, to mobile networks. But in the end, it requires you to have some kind of client-side technology which matches your server-side technology. And this is especially an inhibitor for more advanced authentication methods like biometrics or smart card-based authentication. So we call it that these are silos because it's very difficult um, to, to scale um, to the internet. And of course, the required security level of authentication depends on the use of um, the authentication. So on most existing systems, we have risk engines. These risk engines want to know how good the explicit authentication is. And this is very difficult today to feed, that, um, uh, feed good information into those risk engines. So they have to rely on a lot of additional parameters they gather from the system, like round trip times, or MAC addresses, or IP addresses, whatever they can get, and derive some, um, let's say, geolocation other information from. 
Now, how does FIDO work? And how does the FIDO address all these issues? So in FIDO, we say we need that kind of proxy device anyway. So let's have a concept about this proxy device. And in FIDO, we call it authenticator. Now, with that authenticator and with this clear concept of having that authenticator, we essentially split that authentication between the user and the cloud service into two pieces. So one piece on the left-hand side is what we call the user verification. This is a method how the authenticator makes sure that the user is the user which originally enrolled with the authenticator. And the second is what we call FIDO authentication. So that's a standardized protocol which the authenticator uses to authenticate to a server. Now, with that kind of separation, we, we gain a lot of flexibility. So, for example, we can use and implement completely different user verification methods. So there could be a pin-based method the user uses to the authenticator, but the authenticator would still use the standardized FIDO authentication protocol to the server. So there's no need for the server to know details about the user verification method. For example, if you switch to a different authenticator using fingerprint recognition, for example, or face recognition or speaker recognition, the FIDO server wouldn't have to be changed. It's still the same software. It's still exactly the same protocol um, which the FIDO server um, would use. So this technology scales into different user verification methods very easily. And even if we come up with a completely new user verification method in the future, um, like a, the NUMI, for example, which is uh, some kind of of heartbeat, rate, whatever monitoring um, being used for user verification. This could be easily integrated into the FIDO server because the technology um, on the FIDO server is agnostic to the user verification method. And there's a second dimension of scalability, and this is the, the uh, let's say, the implementation method of that authenticator. So we could leverage existing hardware like a TPM or a secure element or a SIM card to implement an authenticator in, and we could also leverage uh, existing hardware-backed methods like trusted execution environments or um, external USB tokens to implement the authenticator. So all that scalability is now part of FIDO, and this scalability just comes by separating this, uh, the, the user verification method from the standardized FIDO authentication method to the FIDO server. So what the authenticator does with the user is essentially it answers the question, is this the same user as the user which enrolled before? And the authenticator to the FIDO server answers the question, is this the same authenticator as was registered before? So we use different terms, right? We use term register for the authenticator to the FIDO server and enroll for, this, for the user to the authenticator. So essentially the authenticator can recognize the user. But the authenticator doesn't really have an identity pre proof of that user in the sense of uh, knowing the name of that user or additional information. So the authenticator doesn't know whether this is Donald Duck or John Doe. And there's no need for the authenticator. But the FIDO server typically is tied to a backend um, application which is interested in, in knowing the, the identity of that, the physical identity of that user. And so we need some kind of identity binding. And in FIDO, this identity binding is, is a bit out of scope. We say this is not part of the core protocol to give the relying parties the flexibility to implement various um, identity binding methods. And in fact, most relying parties have already found a way to bind an identity to some kind of database record in the backend system. And this uh, identity binding method really depends on the vertical. So for example, it's different in banking than it is in healthcare than it is in e-commerce. And it also depends on the region in the world where you are in. Because the regulations, for example, the banking regulations, the know your customer rules in Europe are slightly different than they are in the US, and they are different than they are in Africa or in Asia. So that gives the, the FIDO protocol essentially the ability to scale globally. Now, I said we can use various user verification methods and various ways to implement the authenticator. Now, the security of authentication depends on the user verification method and on the implementation of that authenticator. It's different 
to implement an authenticator in just, uh, in just normal software running in a rich operating system like a Windows or an Android, or using a TPM or a secure element or a TEE, trusted execution environment, to implement the authenticator in it. Now, somehow the relying party is interested in that combination, in that method. And so we need some kind of attestation, so some way for the authenticator to provide a cryptographic proof to the FIDO server of the identity of that authenticator. Not to be able to distinguish authenticator A from B, but to distinguish between authenticator of model A from authenticator, which is of model B. So just on a model basis. So we don't want to be able to, to recognize a specific device. It's just, now this authenticator has a different security characteristic, so I want to be able to differentiate this authenticator model from a different authenticator model having a different security characteristic. So <clears throat> the authenticator itself provides a cryptographic proof to the FIDO server, and the FIDO server looks up in the metadata additional information about that authenticator. For example, what kind of user verification method is implemented in the, uh, that authenticator, or what kind of combination of user verification methods is implemented. And also, is this authenticator implemented using secure element or a TEE, or is it just normal software running in a rich operating system? So in total, we have implemented a lot of different, let's say, protection mechanisms. Um, I think I will go through the most important ones. And this is first, we use metadata on the server side to let the FIDO server understand the authenticator model and its um, related security characteristics. Now, second, we allow the FIDO server to define a policy of acceptable authenticators. We said that the, um, we have different use cases for authentication in the internet, so there might be a di the need for different policies. Some FIDO server which says any authenticator is better than username password, so I'm happy to accept that. And there might be other uh, FIDO servers which say, now we are heavily regulated, and there is some regulation which re requires us to restrict the, the set of acceptable authenticator to the following ones. And then the FIDO server can list the characteristics of the acceptable authenticators. For example, need to be implemented in TEE or a secure element, or must support some kind of user verification method, um, which is either fingerprint or facial recognition or speaker recognition. So in that um, area. So the third thing is essentially um, a, a protection measure against these large-scale server-side attacks. So we have seen these billions of passwords hacked from servers, and this was due to the fact that the server had to, to store a secret, like a password. Now with FIDO, there's no need to store a secret on a server. We just store public keys on the server. So the best thing the attacker could get from a server is a bunch of public keys and a related user ID. And even the user ID could be a, a number for that. So it doesn't really um, uh, represent a lot of value to, to the attacker. So number four is we provide a cryptographic proof of the authenticator model. This was the attestation I just explained. We generate the keys pairs for authentication for the cryptographic authentication protocol inside the authenticator. And this key is not known to the user. So it's, there is no phishing attack, because the user will never be able to enter the, the, the PIN or the private key in, into the wrong website. On the other hand, in six, we use site-specific keys. And so easy attacks like um, uh, websites which have an um, optically similar name but have a slight difference, like the, the lowercase l and the capital I, which look in, in most fonts very similar or exactly the same. Now, even though the human beings are not able to distinguish those the different URLs, this, the, the software in the authenticator is. So we can tie keys to, to different what we call application IDs. And this is also used to protect the privacy of the user. So if I register my authenticator to two different relying parties, my authenticator will generate two different key pairs, which allow me to keep my accounts completely separated. And these relying parties will never be able, just by looking at the FIDO information, to understand that it's actually the same user. They might be able to do that 
if, if the user enters the same email address, for example, in, in the web form to that relying party, but not by looking at FIDO information itself. Now, number seven is we verify, the authenticator verifies the user before actually signing the authentication response. And number eight is a protection measure against uh, men in the middle, the real-time men in the middle attacks, and this is called channel binding. So it's some information extracted from the TLS channel, which is added to the authentication response. So in the end, we get a set of building blocks in FIDO. So on the right-hand side, we have the relying party uh, set up. On the left-hand side, we have the, the um, user's environment. So on the relying party, we have the normal web application. This is a typically, in the financial situation, it's a banking application. In the e-commerce, it would be the, the shopping application. And this application somehow talks to the FIDO server. So there's no need to expose the FIDO server directly to the internet. So this is in line with most setups in, in data centers of, of um, uh, relying parties at this time. So the FIDO protocol messages are exchanged between the existing web application and the web browser or the mobile app and just added um, to, the edition, to the existing uh, TLS protocol. Now, the FIDO server has a database storing all the cryptographic authentication key references, which is essentially the public keys. And it, the server has a TLS server key, because we need that identity of that server to tie um, the authentication keys to. And it receives updates from, from the metadata service. Now, on the client side, we have the traditional web browser or the mobile app talking to a FIDO client, which receives all that information talking to a authenticator specific module, the ASM in the middle, which is just an abstraction layer to um, unify the way the FIDO client can talk to different authenticators. And the authenticator is the essential part in FIDO. That authenticator stores the attestation private key and a, a bunch of authentication keys, one for each relying party. So now that was a lot of theory. Now let's look how this um, looks in reality, how it works. So we have seen um, we have seen implementations, for example, um, from, from Samsung on the Galaxy S5, and we have taken screenshots. That's what you see on the left-hand side of the screen, and on the right-hand side you see a sequence diagram, which in, um, illustrates a bit how the protocol works. Now, the, the step zero essentially is I want to do shopping. I want to authenticate my my payment uh, using FIDO. So I have to prepare the shopping, which is essentially means I go to the website, I, I have to select whatever I want to shop, I say, yes, I want to add this to the bag, want to do checkout, and in this case, in, in this example, we use a PayPal payment, because the PayPal app on the Galaxy S5 has already been FIDO enabled. So the Android operating system will ask us to select an application to handle that action, in this case, we use a PayPal application. We click on that. Now the PayPal application gets started. It triggers the authentication. So essentially, it talks to the web application, which then talks to the FIDO server and says, I need an authentication request. So the FIDO server generates an authentication request, including a random challenge, sends that to the PayPal application. And the PayPal application receives that authentication request, which essentially looks like this. So it has a header, contains a, a challenge, a policy, like essentially I accept all authenticators, authentication factors, which is the, the fingerprint, the face recognition, the user verification method, or key protection methods. Um, it could be embedded into the phone or could be an external authenticator. Um, it might have a secure display or might not have it, um, don't really care. But there's one authenticator model which is explicitly disallowed. Now, once the authenticator receives that authentication request, the authenticator wants to verify the user. So in this case, it displays um, a FIDO logo in the lower left um, corner. It displays uh, a lot of dots which indicate, let's say, or point to the fingerprint sensor, which is, is the home button um, at the bottom of the, um, of, of the device. So if you swipe your finger, the authenticator verifies the user, uh, signs the challenge, and generates the uh, authentication response. Now this response is then sent to the server, 
the server verifies the response, and the response essentially includes the signed data object, including the signature algorithm, the hash of the final challenge, authenticator random, signature count, and the signature, where the final challenge is the combination of the application ID, the facet ID, channel binding information, and the random number, the challenge generated by the server. Now, once this information gets all verified by the FIDO server, the FIDO server um, indicates success or, or failure to the application. In this case, it was success, so it's just payment complete. Now, the only really required user interaction for the authentication piece, and this is if you, if you go back uh, uh, some slides, it's a user verification. So it's one finger swipe. And compare that with existing requirements uh, for user verification where the user has to enter username or at least the password with uh, what was might, might be a very long uh, string with special characters which is complicated to be typed in on mobile phones. So that's, that's a, 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 a very significant improvement in, in user, user satisf satisfaction. The second portion of that is that in difference to the existing password, which you might forget after a period of time, and if you don't use your PayPal account or your authentication method very often, it might be frequently forgotten. So you don't forget your fingerprint. You just swipe your finger and you are in. So it's a, a much better user experience. So in addition to that authentication, which essentially is a session authentication, FIDO supports a, a functionality which we call transaction confirmation. Now, with transaction confirmation, the FIDO authenticator receives what we call a transaction text. And so this might be an image or it might be a string, which essentially indicates what the user wants to do. In the case of a banking transaction, it might be, I want to transfer $10,000 to bank account 12345. And this unique transaction text will then be digitally signed, first displayed to, to the user. The user can verify it. and either agree or reject the transaction. And after the user has agreed to that transaction, he will verify itself to the authenticator, like the swiping your finger thing, uh, which will unlock the private key. And essentially, then the authenticator will sign that um, transaction text and send the signed transaction text back to the FIDO server. So this allows the FIDO server to verify that the first, the user has seen and confirmed that transaction. And second, that no one has no man in the middle has modified that transaction. And this is a very effective method, especially against man in the browser attacks, where someone in the browser on the left-hand side with the dashed uh, box um, could be able to manipulate the transaction text, whatever sees. So what we have seen in the Euro Grabber attack, essentially. So if you want to protect against this kind of attacks, you better implement transaction confirmation, which is um, supported by FIDO. Now, the, I said the authenticator plays a key role in FIDO, and the, the security primarily depends on the authenticator. Now, the authenticator is, essentially has to implement three different blocks um, of functionality. And the first thing is what we call the, the, the protocol handling. Thing. So this is all the cryptography, like maintaining the attestation private key, generating the, um, the re registration and authentication responses, maintaining the authentication keys, and so on. The second building block in the, inside the authenticator is user verification or a user presence check. So some way to drive the, the swipe your finger and verify the fingerprint or verify um, um, your, your, your face or the speech you have uh, recorded at some time uh, against uh, um, the thing you, you speak right now. And the user presence check would, for example, be something like pressing a button, which malware could not do, but only users could do. It doesn't allow you to understand which user pressed the button, but at least it, it allows you to understand that some user was present at the device, and it's not just malware doing it. Transaction. Um, um, Silently. And the third building block is the transaction confirmation display. So some ability of that authenticator to have a display, to display the transaction text to the user and get a confirmation back from the user. 
Now, there are different ways to implement the authenticator. And the first thing is we can use secure hardware, for example, a SIM card. The authenticator could be implemented as, for example, a Java applet on a SIM card itself. It would keep the keys, the authentication and the attestation key inside the SIM card in the secure hardware, very well protected. Use fingerprint, a pin-based user verification method, and the pin would be entered by some a software SIM toolkit or whatever on, on the mobile phone. So the second implementation option would be using client-side biometrics and uh, having the authenticator run in a trusted execution environment. So in this case, the uh, user verification is also done inside the authenticator, but the uh, biometric reference data, like the fingerprint template, stays local in the authenticator. So there's no need for the FIDO server to know your biometric data, your fingerprint. There's no need for the FIDO server to know your face, right? That's all sensitive private information, and essentially no relying party is really interested to keep that kind of, of information on their server because it would make a very attractive attack target. So it would attract the attackers, and they don't like the attackers. So it's better not to store that sensitive information at the server, and it doesn't by the way, it improves the security to store that information at the server. It's sufficient to store that information inside the, and the authenticator, in this case, a trusted application, and use uh, the, the comparison result, for example, the success to unlock the key after comparison, and then find the authentication response here. And of course, if you want to increase the security level, we could also say, now well, let's use a, a secure element to maintain all the keys and use a trusted application inside the TEE for user verification and for uh, the uh, transaction confirmations for a trusted user interface, essentially, which we need to protect against the man in the browser attacks. Now, another topic is, which we got asked, um, especially in the early days, a lot, that users would say, I don't need to care about authentication because I use federation. I have a federation server. And we said, great. But if you look into the federation protocol, there is a, a, a black hole in it. And this hole essentially means now the user has to enter or authenticate to the um, uh, federation server, to the IDP. So in the end, what, uh, what federation does, it's the second mile. So if you have authenticated to the IDP, to the federation server, it can federate your authentication information to the service provider which essentially reduces the frequency of user authentication to the IDP. So now, if you implement the first mile with FIDO, we can add a lot of value to that um, information because now we, we might use a very strong method to verify the identity. And of course, the uh, IDP knows that uh, verification strength of the identity. But at this time, um, with username password, we use a very weak method. So we don't know whether this is really that user which we have verified before. Now with FIDO, we, ha we have a cryptographic proof about the authentication strength from the registration method, the attestation. So we can add that information about the identity and the authentication strength to the federation message and send that to the service provider. And this is a very convenient method, especially in the enterprise where users would have to um, or can register now to a single federation server and federate to several applications. So there's no need to register separately to the different applications. And in the end, the, each uh, service provider, so each application knows exactly how strong the authentication was and can feed that information into a risk engine or might derive other information from that. And FIDO is not just a concept, so there are existing FIDO-ready products shipping today. So for example, if you look in the Galaxy S5 smartphones or the Galaxy Tab S tablets, Galaxy Alpha, uh, Galaxy Note 4, and so on, that, that's an um, entire product range in the high-end phones which are sold globally, which are already FIDO-enabled. The same with Lenovo ThinkPads, with fingerprint sensors. They all also have a FIDO stack. And in addition to that, there is a um, FIDO stack available for download for, for aftermarket solutions, essentially. So you can install the, the FIDO client, download it from, from our company, for example, in the Apple App Store, 
have the iOS client um, um, supporting Touch ID on iOS 8, which is a very convenient method to do authentication. And again, this authentication server is agnostic to the user verification method. It does not really need to know the device type you're on. But it will get the information what kind of authenticator was used because that's part of the attestation. So the authentication server knows the risk profile of the authenticator and can, can use that to feed it into the risk engine. And there are already a relying parties which accept FIDO today. So one is um, PayPal, which launched the FIDO support in February this year. And there is um, Alipay belonging to the Alibaba group, which also um, launched or publicly launched the FIDO support in July this year. So you can initiate tra financial transactions using FIDO on these devices. So as a conclusion, we have different authentication use cases which lead to different authentication requirements. And today we have authentication silos. So it's very hard for relying parties to exchange the user verification method because they would have to change the server-side technology as well. And large user groups are usually not homogeneous. So they would have to support a lot of different user verification methods, so a lot of different uh, authentication servers in their data centers. And this does not really scale. So in FIDO, we separate the user verification from the authentication protocol and hence support all user verification methods you can think of. So FIDO supports scalable security and convenience. It's privacy friendly because the user verification data is only known to the authenticator. It's not known to the relying party. And FIDO complements federation. So I think that's the, the core part of the webinar today. And uh, we can get questions now. Ralph, uh, let me ask you some of the questions that have come in. First of all, are there any open source references to FIDO authenticators, clients, ASM, servers? So at this time, there are no open source implementations for FIDO UF. There are some open source implementations for, for, for FIDO UTF, which is a different protocol. But uh, of course, the, the standard is, is open to the public. So you can download the, the FIDO uh, specification at the FIDO Alliance website and look into that um, and to understand what's going on. And of course, you, you can um, go to different vendors of um, FIDO components, like, like not, not Labs, for example, for FIDO server, to start a proof of concept um, to pilot a, a FIDO-based authentication solution. Besides PayPal and Alipay, are there any other financial institutions actively prototyping FIDO? Yes. There's, uh, there is um, um, yeah, a bunch of financial institutions. I would say um, most banks are currently looking in, into FIDO solutions. Um, they have not publicly launched these FIDO solutions yet, but I would expect, let's say, um, in the first half of the next year to, to, to see some of the pilot, uh, um, banking pilots and, and um, solutions uh, to become public. What is FIDO's response to mobile devices seeing increasing malware attacks, particularly with Android? So FIDO authenticators can be implemented in a variety of, of um, uh, ways. So one way was to leverage secure elements or trusted execution environments. And those trusted execution environments protect the authenticator implementation from a text to the normal Android world. For example, if you have a rooted phone, the trusted execution environment still is not rooted. It's still protected. So if the authenticator lives inside the trusted execution environment, it is still protected against the um, malware which could potentially exploit um, the root level access to the device. And the same with secure elements. So that's, that's a lot of additional security we add, and also scalable security. So we might see, a, let's say, a very um, secure implementation today, but we might find some potential attacks next year or two years later. Now, in FIDO, you can still continue to use the same protocol, but switch to a more uh, secure implementation because we have learned and we continue to learn about attack vectors and, and countermeasures. 
Does FIDO allow third party integration where additional elements can be added? Um, so, so what do you mean with additional elements? Well, I can't answer that. I'm just reading the question. Okay. So, so FIDO allows for third party integration. So you could have a, a, a mobile application, for example, which uses, uses the FIDO stack. And you could have and implement um, web applications in, on the server side which interact with the FIDO server. The FIDO protocol itself has a lot of extension capabilities in, um, uh, specified into it. So there are a lot of extension fields where FIDO servers could add additional information which need to be conveyed from the FIDO server to the FIDO client. And um, uh, conversely, the FIDO client and the authenticator can also add uh, extension fields to convey additional information. For example, um, let's say um, pin length, the actual pin length, as opposed to the minimum pin length uh, to the file server. So there's a lot of flexibility um, already uh, specified into the protocol. Is it correct that authentication will always be managed by an intermediate, intermediate IDP and never directly between the user and the relying party? No, in FIDO it, it's different. So FIDO protocol. Um, by, by nature, is a end-to-end -end protocol between two two entities. Let's go back to the to the um, building blocks diagram. Um, we see the FIDO server on, on the left hand on the right hand side. We see the browser on the left hand side. So there is no need to have an intermediary in the middle. So there is no need to ha have this third party, the IDP, um, and and some companies are not let's say, um, really uh, liking that kind of, of need for an intermediary, like big banks, they want a direct customer relationship. They don't want to have anyone in the middle of that transaction. This is certainly possible with FIDO. On the other hand, there are some good situations where federation is interesting and already supported, especially in the enterprise, and FIDO does integrate in, well in, into uh, federation systems. So you could add FIDO support to IDPs, and we have done um, uh, pilots, um, so proof of concept implementations with Fortrock and Ping Identity. So you can see how that works and you can use Federation combined with FIDO. So both methods are possible. How will end users get the FIDO software on their devices? Will it be do a downloadable app or bundled with the device when it is purchased? So we have, we have two combinations at this time and, and both will remain for, for length of time. So, so first, we have our FIDO clients available in the App Store. So you can go to, to Apple uh, App Store, for example, and download the FIDO client for the um, iPhone and the iPad devices uh, to support the Touch ID. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have seen and uh, see an increasing number of, of smartphones which are designed and come with, with an um, integrated FIDO stack once they, they leave the factory. So, for example, the Galaxy S5 already has a FIDO authenticator, which is built into the device. So, once you buy the Galaxy S5, the Galaxy Tab S, Alpha, whatever, these newer um, mainstream devices from Samsung, they all contain the FIDO authenticator from the factory. So, you just have to download an application which supports FIDO, which um, then, then um, triggers the FIDO client and, and makes use of the FIDO stack, which is already on the device. Let me let me try and um, go back on a question and then add to it in in, in case it's, it's it looks to me as if it's important. Speaking as a non technical person, what external devices or support is there for additional third device authentication? That was the question you answered a few minutes ago. Now there's some additional information. Not parties. I mean devices like a third device pin pad, USB tap to authorize stick. Web plus server plus mobile device. I don't know if that makes it any clearer to you, Ralph. So not sure I, I really understand the question. So I guess it, it, it's related to <clears throat> is the FIDO authenticator embedded into a device or it's a separate thing? Now FIDO is open to both approaches. We have seen a, 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 a clear need for embedded FIDO authenticators, especially in the mobile landscape, so for smartphones, where users want to act with a single device and not having the need to take some additional card, USB token or whatever hardware device out of their pocket to touch it or tap it on, on the device to actually do FIDO. Even though this would be technically possible, we, we see a clear need 
not to do that and have embedded authenticators in, in, the, in the case of smartphones. Now, the situation is slightly different in the PC world. We have seen a lot of requests for um, separate hardware tokens in the form of USB um, pluggable devices, which can be simply inserted in the USB plug of your laptop, for example, <coughs> and used for FIDO authentication. So both ways are possible. Um, uh, somebody is asking if the slides on the webinar will be available later to the attendees, and the answer is yes, it's being recorded and the recording will be available.